At the funeral, people are scattered around in small groups, their heads following the loudest streams of conversation or the loudest cries. They are either guided by grief or they are grief's warriors. The winds blew the pollen from some orchids into my mother's face and I wiped the okra stain away with my thumb. Men shovel soil onto the coffin until they tire and the machine takes over. Geldi mezarlık cibanı. Here comes the well digger. Bir ay eksiydi. As if that's all that's missing. The coffin is lowered in. We watch as the backhoe dumps the soil and by hand we throw some lumps of mud in ourselves for good measure. My siblings are in a car nearby. They're too young to see this sort of thing. A hoja, Muslim scholar, here to pray for my nene's soul. But mostly it feels like it's for our benefit. When not praying in Arabic, he speaks Turkish. He tells us to stop crying. He said this when we were at the mosque earlier too. God's will, God's decision. This is the way God granted. Allah'ın izni ile, Allah'ın emri ile, Allah böyle nasip etti. The flowers were wasted under the soil, I think. Along with the cheaper carnations, I saw a wreath of white roses cast on top of the coffin, then covered with mud. The ones still left on top are zambak, white lilies. They smell strongly. I overhear a couple of old women discussing how you can get rid of the smell of Easter lilies in about five minutes with a pair of tweezers. If you tweeze the polleni out of the flower after it's opened, you have to be careful, huh? Make sure you've got newspaper underneath. It doesn't matter if the pollen gets everywhere, I can just tape it off. There is a man here whom my mother has nicknamed Topuz Pasha, or Prince of the Shepherd Staff. He got the name because he was always threatening to hit someone with a stick. He's in his 40s, and even though I'm about 10, he comments on the way I look a little bit too much. She's a pretty one, you know. I do know, Ali, thank you. These kinds of men turn up out the blue, making my mother run to the bathroom before she opens the door. She looks in the mirror, frowns, and then gets to the front door. When she invites them in, they usually go into the garden, shut the door behind them, and chatter while they smoke. She goes through cigarette after cigarette. When we leave the cemetery, the smell of incense follows us to the car. Once we get in, I pull my headscarf back down to itch at my neck. We're heading back home and all the cars are following us back. My mum hasn't taught me how to pray before my first mevlit. The prayer session has made my house busier than I've ever seen it. Mostly with people who haven't been over since before I was born. They bring semolina helva and other funeral treats. Someone has thrown one tray of helva into the dustbin. It's too soggy. The husbands have been put in the kitchen. The door has been left ajar and they can hear the Hajar's mevlit prayer from here. It sounds like he's singing. My headscarf keeps falling off. It smells of mothballs from being stuffed in a drawer for too long. I carry a potish tray around the room to women sat crying on rugs and splash lemon colonia on their hands. They rub it on their faces, sighing with relief. A lady from the local cafe jumps up as soon as the prayers are over to prepare food for the hoja. Priorities, I join her in the kitchen. Topuz Pasha is standing apart from the other men, frowning at his phone. From the trays, I take one of each pastry to a plate and start serving. The Hoja leaves early, taking food with him. I hear Pani speaking to someone I don't recognise. I'm an old friend of this family. Back to Cyprus days. Mark Pule's husband was a lovely man, you know, died too young. At least they're together now, yeah. Poor man. Poor Isla, alone with the kids. I resent my dada in moments like this. 
He doesn't seem a good enough reason for my nene to be dead. I wonder about some of the things I heard my nene say about him. I don't know if I heard her right, because all I can really think of when I try to picture him is Fasulia heads. People start to leave. Zaidi has offered to take Erhan and Ipek to hers for the night, but I'm to look after my mother. She's already begun cleaning and I can hear some women saying, how rude to go into the sink while they're still walking out. Her hands are foamed up from washing when she comes to the front door to see people off. Nuri chinde atsin, rest in light. Allah rahmet eylesin, rest in peace. Ring us any time you need, Ayla. Things are quiet again and the house smells of the mevlit. We open all the windows together and sit watching TV. My mum is smoking a lot. She tells me stories about Nena. How she would go to the mosque in our village through a field of wheat and goat's foot weed to pray for her husband. Or how, when I was born, she will cover me in so much olive oil that I stank. I remind her that it is good that Nena is buried where she is. We picked the best place. Zaidi told me there's a nearby cemetery in Tottenham where they found human bones. Apparently, grave robbers are stripping corpses of all their valuables, then leaving them out in the open for the families of the dead to find the next day. She tells me she's worried she won't be able to get the government to cover the funeral costs, as she's paid for some of it already. Just because she's paid for some of it doesn't mean she can afford it. As the night sets in, we put the cat on and the sound of it is comforting. We have mint tea and my mum gets a text, explains she's tired and goes to sleep. Shut the windows before you come upstairs on them. But it's a hot night and there's a breeze to the couch at just the right angle. Our radio stuff. Stop in on 100.4 FM. Each one's a bop. I fall asleep to garage instrumentals, freestyles in my half dreams. We take girls from broken homes. Mind yourself. Where's my Uzi? Where's my phone? Come on mate, cook the man some eggs. Blaze it, deface it, I rearrange it. Shut up fool. Wheel up and come again. I don't care who they are, where they are, if they want to bring beef. Here we are. You're gonna wake her up. I wake up when the music cuts off. Something makes a crashing noise. When my eyes open, I see these men. I like their trainers. One has a pair of black knack pennies on. They look so fresh. You know, they had their own shelf back home. They're standing around a small, small pile that has our TV, DVD player, and some bits from my mom's room. I call for her and get smacked. This big boy slap around the face. It's the first time I've ever been hit by a man. My mum has walked downstairs. She looks at me and I wonder if she's blaming me. Even I am blaming me. It's warm and they've closed the windows behind them. One of them's nice aftershave on the one who smacked me. I feel glad mum fell asleep in her clothes. I think of slasher films and American women who sleep in lingerie, running away from your Freddy Kruegers, your Jasons. Look at her, little mama Sita. Mum looks at me, tells me not to worry and laughs at them. They start shabbing at her and she falls, mouth in an uh, teeth bucking into the floor. They won't let me go to her. It looks like her front tooth has come out. Her hand goes to her face and she stays in a shape, front on the carpet. She's spitting a lot. Mind my shoes, man, mind my shoes. The guy talking is edging away from her cautiously. When she starts shouting in Turkish, one of them understands her. You know what? I know this Hartun. She's not alone around here. Come quick. They leave through the front door quietly. 
when I go to her, I have never felt safer. We hug each other on the floor around our pile of things. And I close my eyes and can't picture my dad's face.